This is a Defocus Media production. What are your job? What's up, everyone? It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glovin. And I'm Dr. Jennifer Lyerly, resident optometry nerd. And welcome to Defocus Media, optometry's number one podcast, where we discuss the hottest topics, latest technology, eyewear, practice management, and more. So sit back, relax, and defocus. What's up, what's up, everyone? It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. Super excited for today's show because I have an eye care celebrity. Now, everybody in the world of opticianary knows about this young lady. They know about the impact that she's created. They know about her knowledge. They know about the papers that she's a part of. The thing that I know is that she makes a huge impact in eye care. And today, I really want to share her story. I want to share her journey. And I want to share what it takes to be uh, an optician but also how can you become a better optician? Because the better the opticians are, the better our practices will be. You see, there's a golden relationship between the optometrist and the optician. And if we can really bring that marriage together, we can change eye care, we can change healthcare, and most importantly, we can change our patient lives. Friends and family, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome to the show, Carissa Dunphy. How are you doing today, Carissa? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hey, I'm excited to have you on the show as well. And I'm super excited just to learn from you, right? Um, You bring a skill set that is just unmatched. And the things that you have done for the eye care industry are truly unmatched, especially when it comes to opticians. So today I really want to explore your journey. But before we get started, we got to get to know you. So I'd love for you to share you know, your background, where you're from, maybe some family, maybe even a fun fact. Let's throw that out there. And then also, most importantly, your why. How did you get in eye care? How did you get this journey started? So let's take it from the top, my friend. All right. I don't know where to begin or how far back to go. I'm a mixed bag of you name it. Um, So my parents were always, and my grandparents were small business owners. So I try to, I'm just at my heart as a small business. I love working with ODs and everyone knows it incorporates, you know, brains with looks. And so that makes it a a fun (laughs) element. Love it. Um, For my college, I actually am a computer application specialist. Okay. Um, I know it has nothing to do with anything. So um, I used to provision servers and build websites and be a super nerd for small businesses. Um, And then I had my son and I couldn't go back to doing what I was doing. So I'm like, all right, I'm taking the first job I could find, which was (laughs) at an OD's office. Um, So the the only thing they had was front desk. So I started at the front desk, had knew nothing, of course, from what I was doing. So uh, eventually I needed more hours. And the the OD was like, you know, you got to be a tech. If you want more hours, you got to be a tech. I'm like, okay, "Okay, I'll learn how to be a tech. So I started teching. And then my manager was like, you're going to lose interest if you don't keep learning. So you need to become an optician. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So, um, and that was, that was correct. I mean, I had a fantastic OD. They were teachers um, through and through, you know, they went to third world countries and did so much volunteer work. And I have so much respect for them and they taught me so much. And um, my manager was like a multi-generation optician who taught me everything old school. So I, I truly have an appreciation for the art and the craft of what we do. Um, at that point, I needed something on paper. So I took my ABO exam and became certified um, by the ABO and CLE and worked in private practice, um, went through a retirement and acquisition, went to a bigger practice. We had five ODs, one MD. We worked in a hospital. We were super busy. We opened a second mm-hmm. practice. Um, we had a finishing lab. We did a ton of co-management with ophthalmology. Wow. So I feel like I have a super like well-rounded view of of the industry, and that's proved to be super important in helping you know be a good resource for others. Um, but I love the constant, non nothing is static ever. Like I need to keep going and keep learning and keep evolving for my brain to be happy. And if I don't have 42 tabs open at all times, I get bored really easy. So <laughs> so that's uh, basically in a nutshell. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, this makes sense. You know, the, the reason why, you know, I've always been attracted to just your brand is just simply because it seems like you're always taking it to the next level for education. And I understand why it's part of your DNA. Um, so yeah. today I would love to be able to share a little bit about your journey and how that education kind of got you to where you're at. But I want to talk a little bit more about the program of how you become an optician. I have a lot of eye care professionals that watch this show, and I have a lot of future eye care professionals that actually tune into this show. Folks that are thinking about becoming an optician, folks that are thinking about becoming an optometrist, folks that are actually also thinking about becoming an ophthalmologist. And I really love to be able to cater to all the demographic that's out there. So if you don't mind just sharing the story of what it looks like from day one going um, and applying and what that process looks like. Because I think it's important to, number one, understand that um, from an optician standpoint as someone that may want to jump into the profession, but also from an OD standpoint, because I don't think a lot of ODs understand all the background, all the knowledge, everything that you do in school to be able to create more value for the patients that they serve day in and day out. So let's take it from the top, if you don't mind, Carissa. Yeah, I mean... Any optician knows it's a craft. It is something that you can't just read in a book and take a test. You have to do it and do it and do it because you can't read it until you see it in your hand and you hold it and then it makes sense. And then you got to know how it applies to everything. Um, so on the traditional optician reroute, there's somewhat of two ways and this I'll try to make it as clear as I can, but it's not super clear. Okay. Um, there's it's not super clear where I care people, optician. right? <laughs> Only right. I care folks geek out on comments like that. It's, it's <laughs> tricky. So there's a certified optician, which is what I am. So I'm certified by the American Board of Opticianry. That is, in essence, layman's terms in a nutshell. It's a nationally recognized competency level. Um, the ABO has optician levels of basic, advanced, and masters. They okay. also have contact lens certifications with those same designations. Um, so that's a national competency. It sets, you know, your mark uh, anywhere you go. You can take it. If you're in any licensed state or whatnot, you can take it. You can just become that. You don't have to do any rules. Okay. Um, about half of the states... Um, do require a license to be an optician. And that uh, qualification and process is determined by that state if you're operating or practicing within its borders. Um, so like I said, it's about half of them. So if you don't live in a licensed state, you know, getting your ABO certification proves you know what you're doing. Okay. Whereas if you are in a licensed state, a lot of opticians are uh, licensed dispensing opticians and certified opticians. Gotcha. So it does get kind of gray, um, but regardless, you know, prove your worth. And getting to that point, everybody learns differently. You know, for optometrists, it's it's a very defined process and, and a setup, I guess you could say. Uh, for opticians, not so much. There are accredited optician reprograms at um, educational facilities that you can go to. Uh, we have one where I live and it actually recently closed within the past few years. So it is becoming a little harder to go through the formal process. Okay. Um, but myself, I learned on self-study and working in the practice. So it is a mix of knowledge and practical application. Um. With that, there's so many resources, which, you know, there's books, there's people who create YouTube channels, there's just free download little PDFs, there's apps for your phone, uh, there's mentorship, there's a whole different level of variety that you can do. And so I always encourage people to find what they prefer and what works best for them, because if you're uncomfortable and you have to learn, you know, compound prism, like it's just going to be too much and you're not going to feel good about it. Right. So you got to find what works. And um, I think a lot of people, you know, in a practice, they feel like I'm in this practice. This is it. This is my world. I got to figure this out. But it's not. There is so much out there and people out there who are willing to help and um, provide the resources. I I can't tell you how many people I've just asked a question and they're like, yeah, of course. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're a lifesaver. And so that's what I hope to get out there more is 
there are resources out there. They're not hiding. They're easy to find. Um, but you just got to have that little extra nudge and know that you want to do it and yeah. you'll be fine. I love it. I love it. And thank you so much for breaking down, you know, the different levels, right? Because I always see all these different uh, letters behind <laughs> names and I'm like, what is that? I just know I'm an OD and it's just OD, right? Now, right. I know we have, you know, all these other letters behind us with some of these doctors, but for me, I'm a simple OD, right? I keep it simple, my friend. But right. I want to circle back and I, I want to touch on, um, you know, resources, right? Um, there are tons of resources out there for opticians, um, tons of resources out there for ODs. But one of the resources that I think is very powerful and very effective and very impactful is Optician Now, which is a site that you have created and a site that has tons of resources to help elevate the career of any eye care professional, just not opticians. You got everything on there from, you know, podcast recommendations to certain articles that can elevate the profession. So today I would really like to kind of dive into that. And maybe you can kind of walk us through what resources you provide on this website. And I want to also mention that background that you had before has definitely helped you with this profession with that website. I'm pretty sure. So you were able to bring that into this profession and this new life that you live, right? Because I'm pretty sure definitely. you designed your own website. <laughs> Yeah. And actually, I forgot to mention this, but um, part of that tech company that I worked for was um, I helped in marketing, uh, but they had a live podcast, which I hosted. So I'm oh, super nice. comfortable doing podcasts and I don't mind putting my face out there. Yeah. Um, but but I do like to stay in my house. I'm a super introvert, <laughs> which most people are surprised by. But well, um, let's get a little bit more into the resources. And shout out to Frank Gomez, who's uh, showing up. This is a live stream for those that are listening to this in the future on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. You can go to our YouTube page at Defocus Media. You can go to our website, Defocus Media Group. Or you can even go to my LinkedIn, Dr. Daryl Glover. And you'll be able to watch this live. And you'll be able to see Carissa's big smile and those amazing glasses that she's wearing this <laughs> evening as well. But let's jump into your website and the resources that you provide, because I think it's a gold mine and it can really help elevate all eye care professionals out there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's a compilation of all the resources that I've found over the years that I found helpful. I would never recommend something that I wouldn't personally use myself. So I've used everything on here um, and it's anything from, you know, general like a newbie receptionist doesn't know the lingo. So here's a great channel for that to, um, you know, there's ophthalmologists who have YouTube channels who explain more of the medical stuff. Um, there's master opticians who have published their own books for basic, for advanced um, certifications. Uh, there's a ton of stuff. One of the things that uh, when I created my website, so I always try to, you know, find a need or see a need, fill a need. Um, yeah. So I scoured to see what people were wanting. And everybody seemed to ask like five questions times a thousand. So I'm like, all right, that's the focus. And one of those giant questions asked everywhere, which I'm sure my optician friends who are listening see this all the time also. <laughs> I'm trying to get my ABO. Where can I study at? Um, so that's the number one focus. And that's the most visited page on my website is the ABO exam study materials. Um, the other thing was in an effort to try to get people out of their shell and out of their like geographical practice box. Um, I want people to know that there are mentors out there that do want to help people. They genuinely want to better the profession. They do. I love it. And so I have a series called the Becoming an Obstetrician series. Wow. And I interviewed, I mean, like dozens of opticians. Okay. All the same questions, about, about five to 10 questions each. And they were very honest with their answers. And it was like, you know, how did you become an optician? How do you know when to get another certification? What did you find surprising on the test? To, you know, a lot of opticians aren't clinical opticians anymore. So why did you transition and those sorts of things? So that series is um, super well read and shared. And I'm like, people come out of the woodwork and say, thank you for this interview. I, you know, those sorts of things. And 
it's very relatable and sort of a, a different approach to it. Kind of like what you're doing, but not video. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I, I'm Mentorship is my jam. You know, I, I almost talk about mentorship on every single podcast because it just, it, it adds so much value to a person, right? To be able to sit down with someone and have a conversation or read an article because not all mentors know that you're their mentor. It could be an article that you read or you can love their work and you always look at their, um, you know, information out there and learn from them. But when you can learn through other people's experiences, it saves you so much headache. Um, it makes life so much easier and you can grow so much quicker. Um, so I'm a big fan of mentorship. I'm going to have to go check out that series and uh, learn because I am interested in knowing you know, especially that, you know, the history of more of the clinical side of, of opticianary to why people are transitioning. Um, and I feel like almost we're seeing more people get back into that clinical side, especially with teleoptometry and things like that. Um, so I'll be curious to know, you know, next year, if you do this, what people's or opticianary, opticians uh, perspective is at that point in time as well. So uh, thanks for sharing that. But uh, talk to us a little bit more about the website, because it's, Number one, it's easy on the eyes. I mean, I'm looking at it right now and the colors, the content, the way it's separated, um, the articles that you have, um, the new and continuing education piece that you have, the must have opticianary books. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, uh, something that I would like for you to maybe touch on is really this social media planner, because this is something that I feel like mm -hmm everyone can benefit from because everyone is now diving deep in social media, but sometimes they get a little lost in the sauce in regards to what to post, how to post, um, and what's great content and what's not great content. So maybe spend a little time on that. Yeah. Uh, part of my background is, you know, with websites and whatnot, that includes SEO and website health and analytics and all that. Um, and so with the social media planner, you know, a lot of offices would post we're closed on this holiday. And that was their post for the month. Gotcha. And I'm like, okay. So I kept seeing these little things and little things and, you know, working in a practice myself, you're, you're, it is really hard to come up with content when you are with patients, 10 hours, you could barely get time to eat some days. Yeah. You can barely go to the bathroom some days, <laughs> um, but how do you do it? Like, how do you do it? So I had created a social media planner um, and it tries to encompass everything that's important with social media. So every day is not a post. Some days it's just all you're doing today is following five new people or all you're doing today is seeing who, uh, who your neighbors are and tagging them in a post, that sort of thing. So it's not yeah. just post, 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 post. It's meant to generally cover your overall presence on social media and, you know, like check your LinkedIn profile, have you done that this year? <laughs> Those sorts of things. I lived on LinkedIn. So yes to that answer, uh, <laughs> that question. But no, that's great. And, and, and sometimes we need someone to coach us and mentor us in the right path um, because the online presence, the online um, arena, that digital footprint is huge. Patients come in educated more than ever, and it's because they're going online and they're leveraging the knowledge that they have. So when they come in, they know the solution that they want. And I always stress, and I can't stress this enough, do not be that eye care professional that does not know more than that patient walking in, especially when it comes to lens technology, because that is embarrassing. And that's a bad look for us as eye care professionals. That goes for opticians, that goes for optometrists. Hell, that even goes for ophthalmologists as well. So we got to make sure that we're educated and leverage the different platforms that we have to learn, but also make sure that we're connecting with the patients with some of this innovative technology that's out there. Yeah. And that's another reason to pursue, you know, your license or your certification because yeah. you need to be prepared for that patient who may know, you know, everybody gets an engineer and <laughs> you need to be prepared. And I don't in optometry, everyone wears 40 hats all the time, yeah. especially in a small practice. And just because you're not an optician doesn't mean you can't learn, you know, a tech that's contact lens certified. So valuable. Oh, yeah. You, know, you can help the optician. You can balance the practice better. You'll help the doctor. You'll help everything. Like, so there is all sorts of different ways you can use these resources of learning other than just to become an optician. Yeah. So 
One thing that I loved about your, your website is an article that I came across. And I really want to spend a little time on this article because this article has changed my life, right? Number one, <laughs> it, it connected with my personal why. But for those that haven't checked it out, the article is um, called Exploring the Impact of Lens Coatings on Emotional Connection. This is something that you have to check out. It is a fantastic read and it's a game changer. And Carissa, what I would like to do today is, you know, really talk about, you know, what was the motivation behind this article and really get into um, the modern connection and the human connection, because you really dive deep into how we can create more value for our patients, but also thinking about how our patients feel when they're in their glasses, not just the frames that look fly and fresh, but really the lens technology, which is a piece as eye care professionals, we always put as the last thing to discuss. So maybe if you could talk about the motivation and let's kind of jump into the guts of the article, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of the why behind everything. Uh, so I love digging for like studies like this that provide a why behind, it's just a coding, like it's just a coding, why do I care, blah, blah, blah. But there's <laughs> so many studies behind the reasoning for which codings do what and how they're superior than others. Um, so this um, article, it's on my website, uh, but it's in the March Review of Optometry. It is a COPE CE for two hours if you need it. Uh, but if not, it's great learning. I read CEs all the time and never take tests just because I want to <laughs> learn the thing. Um so this was an educational grant from Shamir, and most of their uh, studies, the data was provided by them, um, actually comparing their coding against their other coding, <laughs> which is sort of <laughs> sort of good, but sort of odd too. Um, so if you think about a co an anti-glare coding, I hate preaching to the choir here. I, you know, we all want everybody to have anti-glare coatings and treatments and the right one for the task at hand. Um, when it comes to connecting though, you know, I'm wearing a good coding. I chose a coding for a webinar. I would pick a different coding <laughs> for a different lighting, um, but they can help productivity. They can reduce eye strain, eye fatigue, all these things. They help connect. You can see me. Have you guys ever watched the news? And seeing someone with no AR on oh, hideous. drives me crazy. Hideous. I and immediately it, want to change the channel. My or celebrities, or celebrities yeah. taking pictures, doing things. I mean, the lens, no AR, or the frames, the temple's not long enough, or the, the width of the frame not wide enough. I mean, it drives me bonkers, Carissa. Yes. So um, one element we sort of dig into is modern connection, which focuses on digital we're all on computers now. This is, you know, comparing to before COVID, it's very different. We could have never provided this data, I'm sure, if things hadn't changed. Right. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit what makes me nervous about being live on camera, right? Same thing that's in this study. You have to think about your Wi-Fi. You have to think about your camera resolution, your lighting, all the lighting, where it's going to reflect from, the audio. You only see my head. I can't use body language. You can't read me as though if I was in a practice or I was in person. So all of these elements relate to the human connection with one another and first impression. So first impression, we all know how big it is. It's like within a tiniest of a millisecond. And um, we also talk about some studies of Darwin relating to the evolution of natural selection and fight or flight, like that sort of thing. Yeah. Relating to first impressions. Yeah. So it goes deep and whatnot. However, for the more engineer type of opticians, I like all of these angles of those studies, but also they we have a study where it is two studies. Uh, eye visibility compared to first impressions. Right. So if you can see somebody's eye, you're going to have a better connection with them than if you can't. 
like the guy on the news. We don't want to watch that channel. <laughs> and then the second study was coding one compared to coding two. And they were both their studies. They're not going to go against a competitor. They're being fair. And how both of these studies impacted environment, connectivity, trust, confounding, and visibility. And so the two biggest data points were the better coding, the superior coding that is has better visibility. The trust was 80, almost 81%, wow. which is huge. That's huge. And the connectivity was nine, over 93%, yeah. which is huge also. Um, so those were the biggest two key points. But the article has easy to decipher graphs and stuff so <laughs> yeah and the thing that i loved about this i mean it 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 really changes the life of the patient right um they they touch briefly on mental health in the article and to be able to have a lens that can help reduce maybe some discomfort um whenever you are in front of that camera or things that may you know trigger various things in that world um, you know, you want to help negate that as much as you can. And with the article, they were touching briefly on, you know, how a clear lens can give you that connection, how it can give you that trust, how it can make that first impression uh, pretty amazing as well. So this is something that in our practice, we need to have a conversation about. That connection with vision and your lens technology can really make a difference with a patient. It can make a difference with how they feel being in front of people. It can make a difference with the first impression if they're going out for an interview, right? If I'm mm -hmm. interviewing someone and I, I can't see their eyes because the lens is, you know, horrible, um, that's going to distra distract me from really understanding the uh, uh, content or the language or whatever they're trying to tell me about how they're the, the, the best uh, patient that's out there. Um, you know, we got some comments that's popping up here. People are tagging people saying, hey, jump in on this. We need to have a conversation. Uh, but I want to read this message from Masal uh, Rodriguez. Um, she says, I think when well, these these questions are popping up, I can't keep up or <laughs> comments. But um, she says, I think if it is as a learning as a person's love language, strong, listen and communication skills with the patient translate to a successful fitting. Through active listening and targeted questions, it can reveal solutions to problems that they didn't even realize they were struggling with. If their glasses currently have anti-reflective coding with too strong of a presence and distracting during a virtual meeting and a listener doesn't seem to be focused because your glasses are too overpowering, right? Mm -hmm. so we got to make sure that we have the right coding for whatever activities. Just like we talk about glasses uh, for certain activities maybe a sporty frame that has a little more curvature when you're running outside. We have to do the same thing with lens technology when patients or excuse me, yeah, patients or consumers are sitting in front of that monitor or if they're taking pictures or if they're driving at night, what coatings do they have to elevate that activity that they're doing? Um, thank you so much, Marcel, um, for, for that comment. Uh, shout out to Eric. He was on the podcast yesterday He's saying awesome show. Thank you so much for the love and support. <laughs> This is fantastic. So it's a you got great to platform to have it live. This is yeah. super cool interaction. Right, right. So check out the article. It's on Optician now. It's streaming on the bottom of this uh, live stream if you want to learn more and get some of the resources and learn more about Carissa and some of the amazing things that she has done. But most importantly, make sure you tap into those resources. Now, Carissa, whenever I have an opportunity to pick the brain of an optician, especially a guru optician, I always do it. And I want to kind of dive into the importance of the partnership between an optician and an optometrist, because I think that is a huge opportunity to really wow patients, but also create loyalty to your practice and elevate your practice. So I'd really like to talk about, um, you know, how do we create a stronger partnership between an optician and an optometrist? Because there are some optician and optometrists, and you had mentioned this to me prior um, that you worked with in the past. Some don't really care about you know what you do in the optical. Some will write down on the prescription what they mm -hmm. prescribe, and some are just kind of like, "Hey, go do your thing." So let's talk about this partnership. Um, why is it important, and how can we strengthen that partnership? And uh, shout out to Michelle Perro for saying thank you for doing this. We're going to continue keeping these live, great podcasts coming, telling these stories, impacting the eye care industry. Anyone that y'all want to show, feel free to reach out. 
email defocusmedia at gmail.com and we're going to keep it coming but let's talk about this partnership if you don't mind carissa yeah, I think um, you have you don't have to go out to lunch with your OD or, you know, have dinner together, but you do need to have an understanding of each other. And that goes to both ways. Um, like, like you mentioned, uh, some ODs write the name of the lens and the coatings and everything on the RX, and they don't want you to deviate from that. That is their right. That is their practice. That's what they want. They discussed it with the patient. Uh, some ODs, they're like, here's the RX. That's all you get. <laughs> and that's fine. I love, you know, talking I'm with the patient. I've been hearing about that. It makes me some, so scared. It's sad. <laughs> I'm okay with it because I feel like the patient's in good hands. Like I'm, I'm going to take care of the patient and I'm competent to, you know, get to the what they need. Uh, that, that could be different if they were gone elsewhere. Um, but, you know, where I had work, the everyone's great. Like no, nobody was inferior in any way. Um, so the team matters, uh, but I think an understanding of what each person wants, what you need from the OD, what the OD needs from you, um, and that's huge. Communication. Number one is communication, and that starts with the handoff, whether it's, you know, getting called back to the room and doing it in front of the patient. Sometimes that's good because then you're all on the same page Yeah. Uh, where sometimes the handoffs in the dispensary and it's really fast. And then you figure something out and you're like, all right, done deal. Perfect solution. And then the OD comes to you three hours later after they finally get a break <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I forgot we needed to do this lens. And you're like, we went through everything and that, that didn't even come up. Like it's <laughs> So sometimes the patient, what they tell the OD and what they tell the optician also is completely different. Yeah. So communication is super important and cannot be overdone um, because ultimately you don't want to remake anything and you want the patient to be happy because the easier it is, the more they're going to come back. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, the, my best advice is just communication of what everybody needs. And, you know, sometimes that's, I don't have the answer right now. I'm going to check with my OD later and I will call you before close. Yeah. You know, sometimes that happens. Yeah. You know, something that and, and, and all my eye care professionals out there, don't don't try to attack me for saying this, but I really feel at least as an optometrist, we should really take a decent amount of whatever your curriculum is as an optician and apply it to our program, because it is very important to make sure that we prescribe the right solution for our patients. And in optometry school, we do lack a couple of things. Number one, the business aspect of optometry. There are some schools out there that are doing a better job of it. Shout out to Dr. Peabody at IU. They have an <laughs> MBA certificate program that they're allowing their students to do. And these students are taking it to the next level and understand the business. But the other thing that I've noticed that a lot of schools, I'm not going to you know, name call and not say all of them, um, but I've noticed that a lot of schools, they don't spend a lot of time on this part of the program. And I feel like there should be some better education. Um, I know there are different companies that come out to the schools and educate about lens technologies. Transitions Optical is a fantastic organization that really pushes that. Uh, Dr. Kiho goes out and he talks to all the students and educates them about the brand and the product and how the lenses work. Um, so I think we need a little bit more of that um, for our training as ODs. And I think that will really do two things. Number one, create more value and service for the patient, right? But also I think it will bring a better partnership between the optometrist and the optician because now we understand your education and your training and the value that you bring and you understand the value that we bring and then you have that perfect marriage between the two parties. So if they go out tomorrow and change the school curriculum at uh, for optometry students, again, don't attack me. I'm just stating the obvious, but we do need to step it up when it comes to lens technology. And it's always changing. You, It's hard just for an optician to stay on top of it. And that's our job. Yeah. Um, you know, this generation two, generation three, generation nine, yeah. and then they add a plus <laughs> on the end of this. And how is it even different? And it, it does yeah. change. However, there are evolutions in things and, you know, AR stacks and all that stuff. And it does make a difference and your patients do see it. And, you know, you can work on deals with your lab and 
patient satisfaction and volume discounts and all these things. Yeah. Um, so just because you're comfortable with something and it's always worked doesn't mean it's the <laughs> best or the most profitable. That's true. That's true. Again, that's that business aspect and education of lens technology. And I love what Frank Gomez says. Shout out to him. He's been dropping a lot of great comments this evening, but synergy, right? That is huge. We got to have synergy. Having that will help elevate um, the experience for our patients in our office. Uh, so no, I, I, I love that. I mean, it, it sounds like the main thing is uh, trust. And like Marisol said, an explicit communication between the OD and LDO is essential um, so we need to make sure that we do a better job of that. And, you know, Frank Gomez, again, we need to work better together. And Jamie, that's on right now, said great insight. So we appreciate it. Uh, Carissa, you're, you're doing a fantastic job. You got a lot of people showing up to see you and also um, learn from you. So I appreciate all the supporters that you have out here. Again, this is Defocus Media for those that are listening um, on iTunes. Um, check out the YouTube channel because you'll be able to uh, see some of these comments and see some of these colleagues out here. Um, our opticianary friends want to partner with us more. They want to collaborate with us more. They want to educate us more so that at the end of the day, we can truly help our patients live their best lives. Right. Um, so let's 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 kind of switch gears a little bit and let's talk about eyewear. There's no way in the world I could have you on my show and not talk about what your favorite eyewear is. Now, I know we, we chatted a little bit prior and we, we expressed what, your, your, what you own in regards to what your favorite eyewear is. And then also what I guess you desire or wish may pop up in your hand one day as your favorite eyewear. So let's kind of break down both of those, if you don't mind. Oh, it's so hard. Like that is. <laughs> there's. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm on this game show. Have you seen James Corden's game show where they say you have to answer this question or eat the worst thing on earth? Oh, no, I could the, see that. Most but of the people maybe. eat the gross thing. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, my. Pick, pick a brand. We, we need um, to do that with eyewear and have some hideous glasses and something nasty to eat oh, and see which, uh, what, what person would uh, take what, right? <laughs> oh, man. One time I, my practice went bowling in... Uh, glasses everybody had to wear someone else's glasses oh my and goodness that, and that was kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> talk about interesting but um yeah, yeah. So everyone's saying no pressure um so, so let's, let's, um, let's pick one they're saying you're the queen of eyewear we're getting a lot of uh, emojis here with smiling faces so let's hear it let's jump into so, it okay so first of all i am not like style east uh i'm like boring sweats lady who like <laughs> nikes i'm not fashiony so if i were to pick like if i picked a high-end like super like something i could just couldn't afford on my on a daily basis I picked, I'm going to totally say it wrong. Is it Anna Corinne Carlson? Oh, like, yes. Oh, oh, my goodness. Like, just drool. That, like, uh, drool. Her I have to have a safe for them. Oh, yeah. Her, her craftsmanship, her eye for detail, the designs, the textures, the materials, just unmatched. I mean, I, I just yeah. saw, actually, you know what? I just saw her in person at Vision Expo. I was wow. at a... A, an, an event with um, um, Terrence Lacron. Um, he just launched his new business, Icons, and um, she was there. And I think she actually gifted him a nice pair of her frames. And They're he's fantastic. always worn her designs and things like that. I know they have a fantastic relationship. But when I tell you those designs are unmatched, she truly has an eye for just creating beautiful masterpieces of of eyewear. So I, I, I agree. And yes, they are a little pricey, but well worth, <laughs> well worth it. No doubt about it. Yeah. So thanks for that yeah. one. What else do you have for me? Man, if I had to pick just every day, like I wear probably most of the time I'm wearing catch London or, um, Northwest 77. Okay. Sweet. In all honesty, that's, like this is the most color I wear. Like <laughs> you, you far surpass me in the eyewear, but I'm a comfort and function person. I'm more okay. like one of my friends. If you're watching Mickey, hi, I'm sorry, but 
she will wear the cute shoes and have cold feet and I will wear the tennis <laughs> shoes and have warm feet. I'm one of those people. And it's nothing wrong with that. And you know, that brings <laughs> up a great point, right? Every patient that walks through your doors is different and unique. And it's up to us to communicate starting with really our, 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 I, or excuse me, our, our technicians. And then a doctor is supposed to follow up and the eyewear consultant or the optician is supposed to come in and make sure that we find the right needs for that patient. Um, so I, I love that you brought that up. Me personally, I have tons of frames. I love color. I love big and bold. I also like thin metals. I mean, prior to you, I was uh, wearing these, right? Completely different design, right? Completely love, different love color, up. right? Prior to that, what I wore to work today um, outside um, are these, and these are Mira, uh, Transitions Miras. Um, so I like to change it up. I like colors. That was all spectrums of the rainbow when you looked at what I've worn today. And those are three different frames, right? The blue I'm glad I'm not the only one with multiple pairs oh, of glasses no, on no, one. No, no, not at all. You know, that's the thing <laughs> I tell my patients and I tell doctors when I train them is that, yes, I may prescribe 300 pairs of glasses, but I practice what I preach. I wear computer glasses all day at work. I wear glasses that have uh, transitions. I have different colors. I have different glasses for different activities. I'm not trying to sell patient stuff just to sell them to them. I'm selling per their lifestyle. I'm prescribing solutions that's going to elevate their lifestyle. Yeah. And when we can get that through our heads as eye care professionals, it will make life so much easier for you. Um, but Props hey, to everyone... you for that, like wearing glasses with a BIO, like that's not easy. <laughs> so, props to you. Hey, I make it happen. <laughs> and, and, and I am a firm believer that as eye care professionals, and especially as optometrists, every optometrist should wear glasses in the exam lane. I, there's no excuses. That's just me, but don't get that's me. That's how you sell them. About that. Don't get me preaching Every about now and that. then, if you get like a killer pair, like I've yeah. had one frame, I don't even remember how long ago it was. But I probably sold that off my face 20 times just by oh, wearing it. And I, same I with an that. OD. This one had that one pair, and she's like, I, I just want the doctors, the, the glasses that that doctor was. And, and I'm the same way. I, I had this one frame that was a cutler and gross frame. It was round and it had kind of like an eyelash above. It was there were sunglasses, but I made them into computer glasses and I wore them at work. And when I tell tell you I sold that frame probably four times a month. Um, and I wore it for about two years. I mean, that was real. Now I switched over to a different frame. Um, at my eye doctor, we have an exclusive uh, partnership with um, Shaquille O'Neal with the uh, SO collection. And I love this collection because the frames are designed for big head men, um, but also really um, uh, brown and uh, black faces. You know, um, a lot of African-Americans have you know, bigger heads, need longer temples, bridge is a certain kind of way. And these frames truly accommodate to that patient base. Same with Hispanic patients and Asian patients as well. So um, I have a pair of those that are um, an aviator style. And I, I, I sell those off my face a couple of times a month as well. So it is key um, to wear yeah. frames. And again, practice what you preach all day, every day, you know, uh, people are, are shouting out their frame brands, Gazal Eyewear. Shout out to Gazal. <laughs> They've done a fantastic job. T, uh, TC Charton, uh, Made to Fit. They got some great designs for all backgrounds. Vinyl Eyewear. You know, I just saw Vinyl Eyewear on, a, on one of my colleagues at Vision Expo, and that's a pretty interesting story. I may need to bring them on the podcast at some point in time because that's pretty cool how they uh, make their their frames, if it's the same company. I think it's truly Vinylized. all records, vinyl, yeah, yeah design, which is very unique. And um, a lot there's of my- There's a bunch of cool ones. I try to feature unique ones on my Instagram and yeah. there's one that make them out of recycled skateboards. Like oh, there wow. is all sorts of cool stuff out there. Yeah, you see, and I love that. Uh, we we got to branch out and try some of this innovation that's out there. But um, no, that was great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you for keeping it real. You know, if you're more of a meat and potatoes, young lady, that's perfectly OK. <laughs> um, what works for you works for me. Right. But um, hey, we, we've been on for quite a bit of time. You know, I want to close things out. And I always like to close things out by giving a floor to my guests. And I always like to ask them if you could leave one thing with all the listeners, all the followers that are listening to this live stream and podcast right now, what would that be, Carissa? 
I would say you have to be your own advocate for however you're going to grow in whatever you do. Um, you can't just sit there. You have to keep going and keep doing things and keep finding things. The world doesn't stop. I love it. And, and that goes exactly with this content today, right? The whole point of this podcast is how to become a better optician. And the best way to become a better optician is always staying educated, continuously learning, always using the resources that are available. Tap into Optician now. Visit the website. Not just opticians, but my OD friends out there as well. My ophthalmologists that are out there as well. Everyone that's in the office setting from the front desk to the technician to the doctor should check out these resources because it's only going to make you stronger. It's going to elevate your practice. And at the end of the day, our main goal is to make sure that that patient has all the tools and resources to be successful. Carissa, for folks that want to learn more about you, that may want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? I'm probably most active on Instagram. I'm trying to be better about LinkedIn because of you. (laughs) And I'm fair on Facebook, but um, also my website is, you know, there's emails, there's forms and stuff to reach me at. Um, But I'm, I'm pretty online all the time. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for tuning in with me this evening. This has been fantastic. Um, It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. Stay healthy, stay positive, stay blessed. And until next time, peace. All right, colleagues, and it's a wrap. Thank you dearly for hanging out with the Defocus Media team. We hope truly something resonated with you. And if it did, be sure to give us five stars and make sure you follow us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you named it. And our handle is at Defocus Media on all platforms. And until next time, be sure to